Today we continue our series on spiritual resiliency. We're going to be talking about a foundational practice, meditation. I've come to believe that there are two types of people out there. There are ones who are drawn to meditation and the ones who right now are getting up to turn off this live stream because you're not. And since you're sitting in front of your own device, you probably don't even have to get up to do it. If you're in that second group, stay with me, please, because much of what I want to say is targeted to people who at times struggle with meditation. And I should say much of what we want to say to you today, because joining me today is a special guest who knows something about meditation, as well as spiritual resiliency, Lisa November. And lest anyone is concerned about our proximity, Lisa and I are married, and so we're quarantined together. Lisa, it's really wonderful for you to be here today and sharing. This is fun. I know that you feel that meditation is the starting point for all action. Can you say more about why you say that? Meditation brings your mind and body back together in total connection. We're so preoccupied with our lives. We're often rushing into the future or dwelling on past actions, regrets we have. We often lose the present moment. So the best way to get in touch with the present moment is to stop and breathe. Just that one breath can ground you in the here and the now, where you have the conditions for happiness. Are you able to breathe? Are you in touch with the blue sky, birds and trees? Do you have enough to eat and a roof over your head? Those are some of the basic needs of happiness. So yes, you have arrived, you are home in the present moment. In our American culture, we're taught that striving and doing are good. We're taught to be almost constantly in action, to be driven without forethought, contemplation, without wisdom. That doesn't always lead to the right action. We all have habit energies that start as impulses, and cause us to grasp for things outside of ourselves, eating or drinking too much, spending too much money, on and on. Sometimes we get caught in the cycle of overdoing, even of good things. We run around helping this friend or that agency, and we overcommit ourselves, sometimes leading to burnout or exhaustion. We begin to feel irritated or tired, feel underappreciated by our family, our work, or our community. If we can listen to ourselves, to our store consciousness, Listen to our bodies. The best way to do this is to get quiet. <clears throat> Listen for that inner voice. What is going on inside you? The best way out is in. Lao Tzu wrote, Do you have the patience to wait until your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving until the right action arises by itself? We know from the Gospels that Jesus practiced a form of meditation. We're not told exactly what kind, but we know that there was contemplative prayer in the Jewish tradition. Contemplative prayer, meditation, of course, I'm talking about the prayer, the practice of internal silence. When a person seeks to sit silently in the presence of God, the Gospels indicate that Jesus had those kinds of experiences. Several times, the Gospels refer to Jesus going to a solitary place and praying all night long, or praying for a few hours at a time. Unless his prayer list was enormously long, it's difficult to imagine that he was saying verbal prayers all that time. 
inherent in prayer, in communication, in relationship, is this idea of expression and then listening to what the other says. Perhaps that's why most religious traditions have some sort of meditation practice. Different ways that we can descend to a profound level of self that seems to just open out into an unfathomable deep sea of being. Some of us call that sense of spaciousness and wholeness God. Others don't. It doesn't really matter what we call it. What matters is that we find some way to practice it, a way that is right for us, that works for us. So can you talk about how you meditate, what way you have found that's right for you? Well, believe it or not, I try and meditate all the time. Anything can be a mindful meditation, and it is a practice similar to playing an instrument or teaching yourself a new skill. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Anyway, a daily practice for me is sitting meditation, where I come back to my breath. It is that simple, but it's hard to do for any amount of time. I try to come back to my breath in a curious, non-judgmental way, so I don't get frustrated when thoughts interrupt me. I often use and teach gathas, or short verses, to help concentrate the mind. For example, to follow the breath, we might say, breathing in, I know I am breathing in. And breathing out, I know I am breathing out. When you meditate, are you interrupted by thought? Yes, constantly. <laughs> I am alive, so I'm interrupted by thoughts. Just as if you're alive, you'll be interrupted by thoughts. Mm -hmm. The difference is in how I greet those moments. Um, Sharon Salzberg calls it the magic moment to come back to breath with curiosity and non-judgment, um, not with self-criticism. Sometimes when people tell me that they've tried, tried meditating and they just can't sit there without thinking, I say, I can't do that either. <laughs> Laugh about it. What about if people are put off by the idea of meditation or people who just aren't inclined to pursue it because they don't think they can do it or that it's right for them, it doesn't appeal to them? Well, and what I described was sitting meditation, and that's not right for everyone. In classes that I've taught at our Sangha, um, sometimes people report it causes them physical discomfort, that it really is painful to sit. The physical discomfort is common. We're uncomfortable in our bodies. There are so many good teachers who have given us many ways to meditate. We can choose walking meditation or even driving meditation. You can do meditation when you wash the dishes, or when you're getting ready to do a Zoom call. It really comes down to stopping, pausing, and practicing. Again, something that sounds easy in theory, but may be difficult in reality. That is why we use the gathas. So before walking meditation, I may say to myself, the mind can go in a thousand directions, but on this path, I walk in peace. With each step, a gentle breeze blows. With each step, a flower blooms. Then as I'm walking, when thoughts interrupt, when I find I'm planning or ruminating, I just gently remind myself, walking, walking. Peaceful, peaceful. You could use that beautiful scripture we heard this morning. Do not worry about your life what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Thich Nhat Hanh tells us that we may want to become business-less in our everyday life. By this he means we develop a clear insight into who we are from our practice of mindful meditation. 
we can realize that we are already what we want to become. We are relaxed. We are at peace. There is no need to run anymore. We are happy and free from worry and anxiety. This is the way of being that is most needed in this world. And this is the fruit of meditation practice. People are finding all sorts of ways to survive or even to thrive, even now. No matter how we're responding to quarantine, for some of us it's more difficult than for others, but no matter how it is for you, this time is very unique. It is an opening to a deeper experience of life. If we are able to use this moment even if it is very difficult for our own spiritual growth. There are all kinds of important and helpful things that we can do right now and that we should be doing. All of our activities, however, are best grounded in being. Meditation in its many forms is critical to our actions so that our actions will spring naturally from who we are, rather than our actions being mindless avoidance or denial or burnout. We always have to stay in touch with ourselves. So thank you, Lisa, for sharing today. It's fun having you here. And if you're listening and you'd like to deepen your practice of meditation, I invite you to check out the Sangha that is associated with First Congregational Church, Cultivating Mindfulness. We're on Facebook, live and Zoom now. There are meditations and Dharma discussions twice a week on Wednesdays and Saturdays. If you've tried to meditate alone and it doesn't work for you, try it with a group. Try it with this group, actually. You'll find Lisa and I are both there on Saturday mornings. Lisa's there alone on Wednesday mornings, along with a lovely group of meditation practitioners who join both of those days. We even have a half day of mindfulness coming up next Saturday. You can look in the comma, our online newsletter, for details. And of course, since it'll be on Facebook, on Zoom, excuse me, it's open to anyone. You don't even have to live in Fort Worth to be a part of it. Immediately following worship today, just a reminder that we have the Zoom call coming up. Hopefully we'll get our issues worked out with that. It's the chance to check in with our student pastors, Mike and Michelle, about where they are and what they're doing and what comes next for them. I know that Michelle is going to call in from her home in Michigan. Mike is a bit closer to home. So join us just for a half hour or so to show your appreciation for their ministries with us over the past year. And thank you for coming to worship today. Even if we're not able to meet face to face, worship is not the same without you. So thank you for taking the time. I'll see you next Sunday. And until then, a blessing that I heard from Marcus Borg, one of my favorite theologians, you know, for many of us, who says, friends, life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this way with us. So let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind and may peace surround and comfort you.